Okay, today I want to take uh, rules of inference and then look at a specific example at first before we get into proofs and before proofs. I'd like to talk about the axiomatic method and the idea of axioms and undefined terms and postulates before we hit all that. So one of the things when I've mentioned before that you know this idea of math is toys and rules is math comes up with the reason this idea of modeling. So if I would have a particular problem, say this one right here, where I, I've been given a bunch of premises and I'll just label my premises with these particular names just by line, premise three, premise four, premise five, and then say the conclusion. So these are just my premise labels. And if I would have each of these, and they might be based upon particular uh, propositions, A has a particular meaning, W has a particular meaning. And so I would say it's like if A and W, that implies P, and we would go through here. And if we were going to ask the idea of when is an argument like this valid? Well, for an argument like this to be valid would mean, you know, this idea it has to be a tautology. We could go through a truth table, right? The problem with the truth table is because I see six different uh, simple propositions here. So six propositions would tell us that we are going to have uh, two to the six. So two, four, eight, 16, 32. So 64 rows on our truth table and, you know, work it all out and do all this work. And am I, you know, do I get a tautology on that 64 rows? I really don't want to do that. Um, another thing, instead of taking, say, for example, the truth table, we could use this idea of the logical equivalencies to, you know, restate uh, different uh, compound propositions. And we could add to that the rules of inference. and to create uh, some conclusions. Within your, which would then become partial premises until you keep doing this until you would finally show, you know, that the main conclusion, man, why do I keep pushing that? right so we would eventually show that it's valid and so that's one way that we could do it and so honestly truth tables uh, way too difficult to do on this particular problem we'll go ahead and use this one we'll use this technique to say I'm gonna use logical equivalencies to restate certain things but on the other hand we can go through this and so here's my argument we could start off and say that oh look um, proposition one and proposition four together would be okay a and p implies p i don't have p a valid form of reason and is denying the conclusion that would mean that we do not have a and w and we would we would use modus tollens or the rule of inference of denying the conclusion so that works out and so we could get that thing out of out of it right away uh, the other thing is is that we could look at for example we could look at Uh, the fifth premise, we could rewrite premise five to say that, you know what, if E is supposed to imply that I do not have I and I do not have M, well, that's logically the same as saying that I could take that negation out and say, well, this is logically the same as E implies that I don't have I or M, right? That's just using De Morgan's law. Well, let's say I don't want that order. That just simply says, let's use the contraposition. So I would negate both sides. That means if you have I or M, that would imply that you don't have E. So why would I have done this particular technique? And then, so doing this, I would notice that I'm trying to get to a conclusion of not E. Well, now I at least see a not E. So this is still premise five, right? Not only that, if I wanted to, I could use the distribution rule here and break this up into two parts, which would be that if I have I, that implies that I don't have E. And if I have M, that implies that I don't have E. And so these are still logically the same thing. 
we're going through this, this is all premise five. Hey, if you have E, that implies that you do not have I and you do not have M. That's the same thing as saying that if you did have I, that would mean you wouldn't have E and if you, sorry, if you had I, then you wouldn't have E. And if you had M, you wouldn't have E. So all of that is just simply the same thing. These are all still premise five. But this form is more useful because if I look back here, hey, wait a second. I could use modus, sorry, hypothetical syllogism. If I don't have A, then I have I. But if I have I, I don't have E. So I could use my new P5 with the P2 and with the P3, and all of that would say that by hypothetical syllogism, that if I do not have A, that would mean that I do not have E. And if I do not have W, then I do not have E. But then looking at this, well, I could go through here and distribute out the not E and this would then become that if I do not have A or I do not have W, then I do not have E. But another variation of this is to say that take out by De Morgan's, if I have A and W, but I don't have it, that implies that I don't have E. And so this would be a new conclusion. So I have this conclusion. But on the other hand, I also had, so I had this, I did this first, I did this second, I did this third. And so it looks like I have, there was my first conclusion that I came up with. And I mixed up five and two and three and used logical equivalencies along with um, uh, hypothetical syllogism. And I have these two conclusions, but now I can take both of those. And again, if I do not have A and W, hey, I don't have A and W. Well, that implies I don't have E. So, whoops, we read that twice. Not E is a valid conclusion. And so, yes, our above argument form. Why is it an argument form? Because I didn't give you any of the propositions, it just had symbols, is valid. So it's actually valid no matter what things, any words that you put into here that forms propositions, this is going to be valid. So one is I wanted you to see a more complicated you know, argument to show it's valid or possibly invalid. Uh, the second thing I wanted to point out with this, and this is why we have the word here, Superman, at the beginning of this. And the reason why I did that is this is from your textbook. This is a particular problem out of the section on rules of inference. And the problem itself is from 1.6, and it's the very last problem of the section, and it's a little star problem. So this above thing was page 80, number 35 of the textbook. And I'll just go ahead and read it. And what it said was, and we can kind of go back up here, and you can tell why I picked my words. All right, it talks about Superman. And so if Superman was able and willing to prevent evil, then he would prevent evil. On the other hand, if Superman, so and if Superman was not able, then he would be I impotent. If he were unwilling to prevent evil, then he would be malevolent. And now Superman does not prevent evil. And if he did exist, then he is not impotent and he is not malevolent. Therefore, it's a valid conclusion that Superman does not exist. And so you go through this particular problem and yes, it's valid. Now, the thing was is that the Superman argument as you're going through this is Really, this is an argument of philosophy that goes on to the idea of, you know, it's the God 
exists, doesn't exist, argument, right? And it said, you know, that's really what they're actually trying to get to. Now, an important feature, note, if you're given an argument, You have things like a premise, right, which really is just simply a proposition, which is true, false, but not both. This has to be a declarative sentence that is either true or false, but not both. And essentially, when we look at this, when we do an argument, the false is pointless, right, because if it's ever false, the entire thing's true vacuously. What we really want is propositions that are true are the only things that we take in with in our particular arguments. And we want the truth of these premises to mean that the conclusion follows. But here's my particular issue in this example, or even like the Superman example. When we say things like the particular problem, let's go up above, that, you know, if he is unwilling, then he is malevolent. Um, if he is unable, then he is impotent. And for all of these, especially when they're talking about like this particular thing, it's using words like prevent. If we look at the words in this particular example, the words that it's using are like prevent. It's using words like evil. It's using words like malevolent and impotent. All right, this immediately gets down to an issue of understanding the distinction between modeling and reality. We are only talking about things that are declarative sentences that are true or false, but not both. That is a trivial thing when I say the sky is blue, my name is Mark. You can get into philosophy and argue the ideas of like what is knowledge and you kind of go around in circles, which is kind of important that when you hit a circle in your argument, you ought to be making a large pause and understanding that there might be an issue here. But with these particular words, what we're looking at is we don't look at propositions. I mean, what we're looking at is opinion, right? When you go through it, any person's act or an event or a sickness or anything else, what reality is far more complicated than the group of things that we are choosing to model. We are choosing to model things that are true or false, but not both, that are easily understood under a predicate concept. Now, you can spend a time, you know, understanding, and this is kind of an interesting feature of, like, if we just simply t look at the idea of evil or even looking at the what does it mean to prevent, especially in, a, in an actual real world application, uh, one of the things that we have with this is, you know, this is not propositions. And so as a game, this is valid. In real world application, it's not even something that you can apply, right? because you're not even dealing with propositions. And these two things actually gets to an interesting feature in terms of what we do within mathematics. And one of the things that we do within mathematics, what we call the axiomatic method. And one of the things that happens under the axiomatic method is the building up of knowledge or just things that we can do, things that we can understand at the very bottom here, and it builds upwards. You know, we talk about standing on the shoulders of giants. One of the things about the axiomatic method is we start to stand and build upon old things. At the very, very bottom here, for this thing right here, there are axioms. These are also called postulates, plus undefined terms. In other words, at the bottom of all actual reasoning, that the beginning of growth of an ability or the growth of a area of mathematics, at the bottom are things that are 
axiomatic or postulate. So what's an axiom? An axiom or a postulate is simply a proposition you simply know to be true. In other words, I can't, we just accept it. This is, a, this is a sentence that we're just going to say, this thing is true, I cannot prove it, I cannot show it, it is just simply true. On the other hand, what is an undefined term? All right, an undefined term is really what it actually says, right? It's a term I cannot define. It's, it's actually, it's, it's self-recursive. It just is. It's a word that we know, but I cannot define it, right? And so it's an idea. We talk about words or terms. It's a term. It's an idea. It's a word that just is, right? It just is known. Um, I cannot define it. Examples of things like this would be in geometry. We have things like, that's a point, right? I also could talk about the number one. All right, these things just are. Okay, what's a point? It's a point. It has no length, depth, but length and depth requires me to understand what a point is and lots of points and uh, it's simply a point. Can you define it? No. Do you understand what it is? Sure. It is. It's that. I use it. Um, what's the number one? Uh, unit, but that means one. One thing you'll notice here, that is if we try to define these things, you get yourself into a circle. <laughs> you start to, what's a point? A point is a point is a point. You might reword it, but it, it, it's a point. I can't actually define it. What's one? It's, it's one. I can't define it. It just is, and we accept what it is. Okay, the same thing's true with axioms, right? An axiom would be like, here's a line, here's a point, and the parallel postulate says there is exactly one line that goes through this point that is parallel to this line. You can't prove it, right? You just must accept it. It just is. That's an unprovable thing. It's just true. Now, it happens to be only true on flat geometries. That's what we're talking about here, because if it was, on the other hand, the geometry on a sphere, then this posture, the parallel postulate changes to, on the geometry on a sphere, if you have a line and a point, there are no lines that go through that point that do not intersect the other line. So there is no such thing as a parallel line. And so in that form of geometry. So what happens is if down here, for example, if I pick, there's exactly one parallel line geometry, what gets built up on top of this is the geometry of flat planes. If I say that there is no such thing as the parallel line, all lines cross, then it's accepting that postulate, what gets built upon this is geometries that exist on spheres, on, on the surface of the Earth. If I would say that there are an infinite number of parallel lines, so if I have this in point, there's an infinite number of lines that go through this and do not cross that line. If that's true, then the geometry that I build on top, up on top of this is hyperbolic geometry. If you change up what you accept and then build upon it, the thing that you get on top of it mathematically is different, right? You'll have flat plane geometry, spherical geometry, and they all start at the end. You just simply have this. The idea of things that you must accept to be true, things that you must accept to be are because we experience them, but we cannot define them. We cannot show them to be true. We just simply know that they are. And that's kind of gets down to back up onto this problem, right? When we're getting back into this problem and we have the same thing, we're modeling human discussions. We are modeling things that we know. For example, what's true? I can't define that. It just is, and I accept it. What's a lie? It's not true, right? It's like, it's the negation of truth, and what's that? I can't define that. It just, I mean, these things are, if it's true, and then we have not true, is it capable of mixing? Well, we have weird, complicated things to say. 
we have you know a lot of things like we would go through it and say could you define what this means can you when we have an awful lot of discussions a lot of time we spend in the understanding of the premise you know what what does it mean you know if we would go back to this real truly true discussion should you bring logic sure we can bring logic to bear but does logic supersede the fact that we are modeling with logic human interaction discussions and to understand that there are things that are I know evil when I see it. Can I define it? No. You know, we would sit there and think of one act, and a friend of mine just brought up today, you know, an example of wartime decisions, you know, you know, where codes were broke from one nation to the other nation, and you could prevent thousands of people from dying in a ship, on a military ship, but to, because you broke the code and you knew that they were going to attack it, but on the other hand, if you prevented it, they would figure out that you broke the code. And that would be like, well, then other people. So is it evil to let that ship go down? When we look at things that are true or false, but not both, <laughs> application is always in the real world is always so much more subtle. And this is important as well, not just here in this very low level playground of what we are doing and we are going to get to proofs and showing things that are exact and we're going to talk about number theory. Another part to understand is that when you do science, when you do modeling, don't get obsessed in your model. It's a model of something that is. And if your model is wrong, it's wrong. And how do you know it's wrong? Because it didn't match up with reality. Reality wins. And so there's times that that's, that's an important part of the scientific method. You test, you guess, you start off, you start building, then you actually go out and look. And if what you thought would happen doesn't match up with reality, then your model must be thrown out. It's wrong, right? Thrown out in some way. And so that's one of the things that we do. We are trying to model you know, different aspects, including human discussions. So now we're going to take this axiomatic method and we're going to use rules of inference and logical equivalencies. And then what we're going to do is we're going to show build up knowledge, which is a collection of things that we know to be true. And eventually these will form areas of math. We'll have things like number theory, graph theory, as they grow up from the little parts into the big parts.